Welcome to I Am Concordia. We're so happy to have you here with us. I'm Ola Liberti. And I'm Giovanni Bertolo. Thank you for joining us. Today we're located at the Hall Building at Concordia's downtown campus. This is Concordia Central. This building has the most classes and the highest traffic. It's also home to Reggie's, the Mezzanine, and most of the Concordia associations. It's also where the Concordia Student Union is headquartered. Giovanni, did you know that the CSU controls over 1.6 million of student money paid in fees every semester? Wow. If anybody wants to check up on how the CSU is spending the money, they can go to the CSU's monthly council meeting. I am Concordia reporter Andrew Tevendale with the latest council meeting on Wednesday, October 10th. He joins us live. Andrew, I know cameras weren't allowed into the council, but I understand it was quite the scene there. Yes, that's right, Ode. The, the meeting started off well enough, but quickly turned into a war of words between councillors and some of the students in attendance. One of the first things that happened was uh, councillors Jason Gonziola, Emily Tetro, and Fabi Abdallah were kicked out of office. As you know, student councillors are elected representatives by students, and the elections are held every year in March. The reason stated by Chairperson Sarah Rodier was that these, these, the councillors in question were not registered for any fall classes. That was really the beginning of the end for the, uh, f for the meeting. Uh, things quickly, quickly turned into chaos when Ethan Cox, uh, when, he, when Ethan Cox voiced his uh, accused, rather, accused uh, Stephen Rosenshine of electoral fraud. Uh, Ethan, Cox ran, Ethan Cox ran against Rosenshine and lost in last year's election. Shortly after, Cox, security was called to remove Cox and three or four other students for being disruptive. We were able to obtain some audio of this. Let's, let's listen in. Andrew, what ended up happening? Well, security at Concordia does not technically have the right to forcibly eject students from campus. Only the police can do that. But when security was called in for a second time due to disruptions at the meeting, Chairperson Sarah Rodier did threaten to call the police and to have Cox and other, and other students removed. So Andrew, I understand you spoke with CSU President Angelica Novoa after the meeting. What did she have to say? Yes, that's right, Ode. I asked, I asked her to comment on what happened with Cox, and here's what she had to say. I, I think it's completely ridiculous that we're not, as students who want to participate in a democratic um, process, we're sometimes not letting people do that because we want to just scream out loud and be heard, and we're not... I, I think the frustration was more that you know, the councillors could not go on with the meeting and they're elected to do a job, but it's being, they're not being allowed to do that just because some people want to be louder than them. Um, the people who scream the loudest are pro uh, the people who didn't win an election before. So that leads me to believe and will lead anybody to believe that there's political ambitions behind all of the, um, all of the yelling and screaming and all of the accusations really have political motivations behind them. I also, I also asked her why they don't allow cameras into the meetings. As you know, a, d a, decision was, a decision was made earlier this year to allow uh, broadcast and internet publication of, the, uh, of these student council meetings. However, that decision was, uh, what was repealed. Here she is answering that. There were concerns about uh, people having to sign releases at every single meeting, which would include not only the counselors, but any observers. Anybody who's at the meeting would definitely have to sign a release and as soon as that's not, as soon as one person doesn't sign it, you pretty much have to shut down the cameras because at any point in time if you catch them on camera, they could technically sue you. Council meetings are open to any undergraduate student and anybody can come in, so in that sense, every, we're not impeding anybody's right. After all that commotion, the council voted uh, to go into a closed session. During, during that closed session, the council voted to add, uh, to add a question to the November ballot asking students for a 25 cent increase to the CSU. The CSU currently gets $1.50 per credit. 
the, the money would go to new, pro, to, to new programs like free lunches at the Loyola campus, an emergency food bank for students, and new, tutor, and new tutoring services. Another item on the agenda that was passed was a, was a request by the Concordia newspaper uh, requesting for an increase in nine cents, uh, a, a nine cent fee levy increase. The Concordia newspaper currently gets 10 cents per credit in comparison with the Link student newspaper which receives 19 cents. And lastly, the issue of gender neutral bathrooms was, uh, was brought up at the meeting. The, the CSU will be looking into whether or not existing bathrooms can be converted into, uh, into, into, general, into gender, neutral, uh, gender neutral facilities. Thanks, Andrew. That was Andrew Tivendale reporting on Wednesday CSU Council meeting. The referendum will take place on November 27th, 28th and 29th. All undergraduate students are allowed to vote. For more information on this referendum or on the CSU's council meeting, visit csu.qc.ca. With talks of high divorce rates in civil unions, many Canadians are left to wonder, what value does marriage have in the eyes of young Canadians? Our own Amanda Sarnito went out to investigate. Forty years ago, marriage was the ultimate step into adulthood. Teenagers fell in love, finished high school, and by their early 20s, exchanged vows. Today, young Canadians are not quite rushing to the altar. They're too busy going to school, maintaining a social life, and struggling to get their careers on track. But what happened to getting married? Irene Patopoulos is a counselor in Concordia University's Counseling and Development Department. She says young adults don't think of marriage the same way their parents did. But now we see a lot more career-minded individuals. People want to develop their career, their, uh, live their life in, in a different way. So marriage takes longer to actually be um, seen as a choice. Nowadays, it's a lot more acceptable to live with someone and enjoy all the benefits of marriage without actually being married. A recent Statistics Canada study reveals for the first time ever that marriage is losing ground to common law unions. Stefania Campagnolo and Carmelo Bonadonna have been in a common law union for over three years. Campagnolo is 21 and Bonadonna is 23. Even though they are happy in their relationship, they have no plans to get married in the near future. It's better this way. Um, we have school, we have work. We don't have time to think about marriage and stuff like that. So. Exactly. We don't need marriage. I mean, we're happy. We're happy living together. We don't need to take that, uh, that step. This choice to live together without being married is becoming increasingly popular, especially in Quebec. 35% of Quebec couples are currently living in common law unions. One reason why young adults may be thinking twice about marriage is the high divorce rate among baby boomers. According to Statistics Canada, about 40% of Canadian marriage end in divorce before the couple reaches their 30th anniversary. For Campagnolo, divorce has hit close to home. Well, when I was really young, my parents got divorced, so it kind of gave me a bad perception of the whole marriage thing, and I don't find it any different from, well, if we're married, I don't find it any different from what we have now. To me, marriage would be just a title. For many students, like those here at Concordia University, wedding bells aren't likely to be heard anytime soon. When asked about marriage, many students said they were nowhere near being ready for it. It seems like there's a lot of other priorities that come first, and marriage is like the last thing on my mind, personally. I feel like I would need to finish my school first, be settled, and then when I'm like 30 years old, I'll think about marriage. But right now, I don't think so. <laughs> I am in a relationship and of course it's going to be on my mind in the years to come, but when I think about it, a career is always more important before you're going to build a marriage. Although the concept of marriage is changing, it would be wrong to say that all young Canadians wait to get married. Sean Zufren and Veronica Delfino are engaged. Zufren is 22 and Delfino is 21. Even though they are both still in university, they are in the middle of planning their wedding set for next June. Well, we'd been dating for a while. I thought it was appropriate. I knew I was going to spend the rest of my life with her. Uh, I had a gut feeling. So after talking to her parents, who were very excited the, the entire idea, there was nothing else to do, so I proposed. Both Dufresne and Delfino are very traditional and believe they should be married before moving in together. 
they admit that it was difficult for their friends to understand. Like, for a lot of people, I have to tell them I'm not getting married because I'm not pregnant, you know? Like, it's actually because I'm in love and, like, it's the guy that I want to be with for the rest of my life. Although couples like Sufren and Delfino may be rare, some might say it's refreshing to see two young adults who are willing to make that special commitment. One thing that hasn't changed over the past 40 years is the belief in true love. Many young Canadians continue to hope that one day they will find someone to share their lives with, whether or not they make it to the altar. For I am Concordia, I'm Amanda Starnino. The Concordia newspaper elected a new editor-in-chief on Wednesday, October 10th. Toby Elliott was elected to the post in a by-election after former editor-in-chief Jared Book resigned. I, I've, I've never been in charge of a team this good, this dynamic, people that are so engaged, that love what they're doing. The Concordia newspaper is one of two student newspapers on campus. It prints 10,000 copies every week. Extracurricular activities are a big part of student life here at Concordia. But for some Concordia students, it's not that simple. Maria Barilero explains. Many students worry about classes and exams, but for students like Remy Steben, getting around is the biggest concern. Steben is a journalism student at Concordia. This year he has started working with The Concordian, Concordia's weekly independent newspaper. Students are always encouraged to participate in extracurricular activities, but for Steben, that's easier said than done. I can't even get to the offices of The Concordian because there's two steps to get in. Two steps may not seem like much, but to a wheelchair, well, especially an electric wheelchair that you can't really lift manually, that's a, well, a showstopper right there. Steben argues that Concordia could easily install a ramp over those steps to help him gain access to the office. Until a ramp is put in place, the Concordian staff have moved their weekly meetings to a vacant classroom in the Communications and Journalism building. They want Steben to be able to participate like everyone else. Dr. Leo Bissonnet is the coordinator of the Access Center for Students with Disabilities. He is also visually impaired. He says putting a ramp in that particular location just isn't that simple. If you were to try and ramp those two or three steps, you would have a ramp that would be far too steep to be safely used. Steben was born with his physical handicap, and after 24 years, he says he has been down enough ramps to know the limitations of his wheelchair. Sure, the ramp would be steep to a point, but it's nothing that like um, a wheelchair, or at least an electric wheelchair, can't manage. Unfortunately, Dr. Bissonnet says very little can be done in terms of accessibility in some of Concordia's oldest buildings, like this one. Until a permanent solution can be found, Steben says students can actually help make life a little easier for the physically impaired. Unless you're going like to the 10th floor, whatever, very high up, don't use the elevator. I mean, you have legs for a reason, you might as well use them. For I am Concordia, I'm Maria Barilaro. Thank you, Maria, for that report. We'll be back after this. There's a difference between consuming for your own personal use and having pounds upon pounds of marijuana stashed in your garage to sell to other people. Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, I, I remember from uh, my experience with, with marijuana that it's not the kind of gateway drug that people talk about. We do have medical marijuana in this country, so if it's helping a segment of the population, why should it be as bad as other drugs? Absolutely not. I think it's a huge waste of time. It's silly. It's a waste of police effort. They should be doing a lot more useful things than chasing up people who smoke dope, uh, really. I don't know what the Canadian law is, but in the state of Pennsylvania where I live, it's, it is a criminal offense, and I believe it should stay that way. Halloween is creeping up, and many of us just have problems trying to find a costume. Remember when it was mommy that got us all dressed up? Yeah, it seems a lot harder now. I am Concordia reporter Maria Barilaro found someone who can help you. Halloween isn't just about the pumpkins or the candies. 
One of the most important parts about this holiday is finding a really great costume. And I don't know about you, but every year this is a big challenge for me. So I decided to find my very own Halloween costume expert. And no one knows Halloween like a child does. With 12 years of costume experience behind her, Anna Maria Yanakis is here with us today to share her costume ideas. So Anna Maria, what's your favorite part about Halloween? My favorite part about Halloween is definitely finding the perfect costume. Isn't it hard to find a really great costume? No, of course not. You can make costumes out of things you already own. Really? Let's go find out. Come here, I'll show you. Okay. All right, so let's find out what we need. Well, we'll need these shoes. Okay. We'll need this. Here you go. Ooh, very nice. We'll definitely need one of these. Okay. And of course, one of these. Okay, Anna Maria, so let's talk about your very first costume idea. My first costume idea is a cowgirl or cowboy outfit. Mm -hmm. And how do we go about making a cowgirl or cowboy outfit? Well, first of all, a cowgirl outfit, you most definitely need a checkered top. Just like this one. Okay, a checkered shirt with buttons in the front. Yeah. Okay. This you could also use for a cowboy outfit, of course. Uh, then you would need a belt just like this one to tie it around. So we really need a big thick belt, is that what you mean? Yeah, a thick belt. Whichever kind doesn't necessarily have to be like this one, as long okay. as it's a thick belt. Okay. Then for both costumes, you of course need a hat, that's for sure. Just like this one. Okay, and let's say you don't have a cowgirl or cowboy hat. Can we find something like that at the dollar store or something? Of course you can. Well, so far so good. Anything that can be bought at the dollar store can't be that difficult to get your hands on. What's next? The next idea I had in mind was a rock star. And how do you go about becoming a rock star? All you really need is a simple black top just like yours. Along with a black top, you'll also need black boots and black pants. But that's when the fun starts. You could then go to the dollar store, buy different color hairspray, and make your hair as funky as you want it. You could then use black eyeliner for your eyes, red nail polish, and then you could use regular hairspray to make your hair as big as you want it. Well, the rock star idea doesn't seem too hard to do. Do you have one more for us? In fact, I do. It's someone that has just been electrocuted. Electrocuted? How can you possibly do that? Well, it's not that easy, but all you really need is some hairspray to make your hair as big as possible. Then you need some white powder to make your face as pale as possible. And if you have any ripped clothing, that's what you could use. Okay, so if you have old clothing lying around the house that you don't need anymore, you can rip it up and make it look like you've just been electrocuted? Yes, just like that. Well, that sounds like a pretty fun idea. How about we go get into our costumes right now and see how they turn out? That's a great idea. Let's go. Well, it's a nice day. Well, that's all we got for you today. You don't look too bad there, Rockstar. You don't look too bad yourself, cowgirl. Happy Halloween! Thanks, Maria, but there's another thing you need for Halloween, a pumpkin. But other than decoration, what can you do with a 10-pound pumpkin? Well, you eat it. Come check out what I whipped up in my kitchen. Today, let's cook up something special for Halloween and see the many uses one can do with a pumpkin. First, we'll do pumpkin soup that serves six people. Here's what you'll need. Two cups of pumpkin flesh, three potatoes, two carrots, one big onion, one leek, the white part only, ten cups of chicken broth, and more or less one cup of 15% cream, or if you want to reduce the fat, 10% cream, or even milk. First things first, let's carve the pumpkin in order to do cream of pumpkin soup. Once the pumpkin is carved, comes the happy time of going inside the pumpkin. Separate the seeds from the inside of the pumpkin. Next up, we scrape the inside. 
I won't lie to you, this requires a lot of strength. Next up, chop the inside of the pumpkin. Yeah. Chop the carrot, the potatoes, the onion, and the leek. Next up, add the vegetables to the chicken broth. Be careful, it's really warm. Bring this lovely mixture to boil and let it simmer for 30 minutes. While the soup simmers, let's broil the pumpkin seeds. Put the seed in a pan with aluminum paper. Put some olive oil. Just a little, like a drizzle. A little bit of salt. Next, put the oven on broil and put the seed inside for 20 to 30 minutes. While you wait, why don't you decorate your pumpkin? Sharpie in hand? Be afraid, pumpkin. Be very afraid. So the 30 minutes have passed. The mixture has simmered. Now let's take the seeds out. Mm, nice and crispy. Let's season the mixture. A little bit of pepper. A bit of salt. And, what do you know, some herbe de Provence. Now, let's go to the blender. Put everything on grind. Add a little cream to the mix. Et voila! So there you have it. Fantastic cream of pumpkin soup, a faceless pumpkin, and pumpkin seeds. From my kitchen to yours, amo la liberté. Happy Halloween et bon appétit. Mmm, that sure did look delicious. It was. Do you know how to make pumpkin pie? No, I don't. <sighs> I love pie. We'll be back next with the weather. Good morning, Concordia. It's a beautiful fall day. Let's have a look at your five-day forecast. Today's high is expected to reach 15 degrees. This afternoon will be mostly sunny with some cloudy periods. So enjoy today's weather because the weekend is looking wet with rain tomorrow and a high of only 15. And again, some more rain on Sunday with some sunny breaks, but a high of only 10. The sun will be back on Monday, but bring your jackets out if you're expecting to leave the house. It's gonna be a bit cooler uh, with a high of only five degrees. And on Tuesday, we're expecting light rain and a high again of only five degrees. With your weather, this is Rob Kimakchioglu. Back to you, Giovanni. Thanks, Rob. After capturing the Shrine Bowl one week earlier, the Concordia Stingers football team were looking to add to their trophy case, taking on the McGill Redmond for the Shaughnessy Cup. Let's see what happened. In the first quarter on Concordia's opening drive, on third down and one, the Stingers faked the punt attempt and direct snapped the pigskin to Blair Yaketti, who ran 52 yards for the first major of the game. 7-0 Stingers over the McGill Redmen. The Redmen would respond at the end of the first frame when McGill's quarterback Matt Connell connected with his favorite target, Eric Galas, for a 60-yard touchdown pass. In the second quarter, rookie quarterback Liam Mahoney sent the pass to wide receiver Corey Watson and he would rumble 62 yards 
14-7 Concordia. At the end of the second on first and goal on the Redmond three-yard line, Mahoney shovel past the ball to an open Nick Sissons for a three-yard touchdown. Going over right now in the third quarter, the floodgates would continue to open for the Stingers as Liam Mahoney hooked up with Mark Champagny for a 15-yard strike. Mahoney would later call his own number and rush 10 yards for the major, followed by a one-yard touchdown rush from Edom Niemetti. The Redmen would finally answer back after a Concordia fumble. Cassell found the wide open Charles Antoine Sinut for McGill's second touchdown. McGill would add a third touchdown in the opening stages of the fourth, but Liam Mahoney once again found Corey Watson for his second touchdown of the game. It would seal the deal for the Stingers. 58-30 is your final score. The Stinger offense looked fantastic on Saturday, amassing 639 total offensive yards. Quarterback Liam Mahoney finished the game with five touchdowns and wasted no time singing the praises of his teammates. It was by far the best game that the whole team has played. Offensively, definitely, it was the best game. We, uh, we've we been racking up a lot of yards the past couple weeks, but we couldn't put the ball in the end zone. I, like This game kind of got the ball rolling, hopefully, and, and we finally put some points on the board. It was good. It was really good to see a lot of points on the board. So I think it will build confidence for next week. It was time for us to catch fire. The playoffs are around the corner. Uh, we want to solidify our playoff spot, and we also want to make sure that we're playing our best football at the playoff time. And now for a special editorial by Andrew Tevendale. Here is Tevendale's take on Harper's new drug policy. Three weeks ago, the Conservative government unveiled their new strategy for fighting the war on drugs here in Canada. Now don't get me wrong, Class A drugs like heroin, crystal meth, cocaine and crack are all highly dangerous and addictive substances. My only problem is that they're also categorizing marijuana with these much harder, more addictive substances. Marijuana? Are you kidding me? Currently under the Tories, this can get you a criminal record. Want to go to California? Sorry, Stephen Harper doesn't want you drug peddling hippies going anywhere. Want to get a job at Air Canada? Ain't gonna happen. Want to be a border guard? Ain't gonna happen. Want to drive the bus? It ain't gonna happen. In fact, there are over 600,000 Canadians with criminal records for simple possession of marijuana. Alcohol and tobacco are legal substances, yet, for, yet over 45,000 Canadians die every year as a result of smoking cigarettes. Millions of people abuse alcohol. Cirrhosis of the liver, drunk driving, need I say more? Have you, ever, have you ever, ever heard of anyone dying from a marijuana overdose? Never? That's right, no one has ever died from rocking too much ganj. You know what happens when you smoke weed? You get a little sleepy and you go to town on your tub of ice cream some beef jerky, some peanut butter, get some haagen ice cream bars, a whole lot of hot, make sure chocolate, gotta have chocolate, man. If you go to the anti-drug activist website, theantidrug.com, they're gonna tell you that smoking, that smoking weed contributes to general apathy, irresponsible behavior, and risky choices. Risky choices? Bill Clinton smoked weed. I experimented with marijuana a time or two and didn't inhale. If you ask me, you can make infinitely dumber choices with a bottle of Jack Daniels at your side. When was the last time weed made you engage in conversation with the garbage can? Or have a nice long makeout session with the porcelain pony? Mmm, yummy. Laugh uncontrollably? Maybe. When was the last time weed made you pass out during sex? Now that would take a lot of pot. It's true that smoking any kind of substance will have negative side effects. But when was the last time you heard of a doctor prescribing a carton of McDonald's just to alleviate the nausea caused from cancer treatment? If the government really wanted to be responsible, then they would legalize pot and reinvest the money back into the education system. In British Columbia alone, the pot trade is a multi-billion dollar industry. That's why the housing market has exploded. Everybody wants land for a grow operation. I'm not saying that we should condone the use of a controlled substance among minors. All I'm saying is that if we legalize it, they would have a lot less access to it. The weed man does not ask for ID, but the cashier at the government-sponsored dope shop will. The government loves to control our lives. So why not chalk up another substance they can tax us on? Everybody wins. Smokers get their fix and the government gets more money. Yes! People make informed decisions every day when it comes to alcohol and tobacco. So why not let them make those same decisions when it comes to weed? Other people would argue that the legalization of marijuana would only encourage more people to smoke. The fact of the matter is that current drug laws are not acting as a deterrent against smoking pot. There is no winning a war on drugs. It is an absurd notion. I'm Andrew Tevendale, and you can stick that in your pipe and smoke it. Thanks, Andrew. That was really insightful. Thanks for watching, everyone. Join us again on November 16th at 10 a.m. 
Amo la liberté. And I'm Giovanni Bertolo. Happy, Happy Halloween! Halloween.